Okay, there are a few people that said they had questions, so we'll take questions right now. Anyone that has a question, we'll just go one after the other, yes. We have at Seventh-day Adventist, the conference Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes. We have now three Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes. And we have some independent or yes. separate historic Seventh-day Adventist there are various differing beliefs in even in the conference yes Seventh -day Adventist. very much so and there the same is true in the free seventh day adventist and and among the other historics and independents etc yes what advice can you give us to encourage us to um, Encourage you to to have uh, uh, a strong uh, direction in which we're trying to live in these very troublesome times. That's a huge question. <laughs> it's a huge problem for us. To uh, mm. I refer you first of all to Ephesians four in which Ephesians, and I've preached many sermons on this, but in brief, Ephesians 4 teaches two levels of unity. Now the highest level of unity that we're going to reach before Jesus comes is in about verse 15, that we are going to come to a perfect man. We're going to come to a, a unity of the faith. That's unity of belief. We're not there yet. We're going to be there before Jesus comes. By the way, that does not believe that everybody will believe every detail exactly the same, but we will believe all the things that really count, the, the major things the same. However, there's another level of unity. We're not even there yet. That's a lower level of unity that we need to strive for. And that's in about verse 2 and 3 in Ephesians 4. That's a unity of spirit. We need to, first of all, develop unity of spirit as we're striving at the same time to come into unity of belief. I was in a meeting just a few weeks ago in Colorado. We met with some leaders in the Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now that's another group. They've been around since the 1920s. We are working to try to come into unity and harmony with these people. Now we don't understand theology exactly the same, and we know we don't. But we talked together and we said, you know, we both believe in the Bible. We both believe in the spirit of prophecy. We both believe in the Ten Commandments. We both believe in the three angels' messages. We're so close on all the big things that we should have unity and harmony among us even though we don't understand all the theology the same. Well, we talked with each other. Uh, we made some confessions with each other because the, the certain things were between us. And after we did that, we said, you know, we're brothers. In fact, those of us that were there the people that were in the independent groups and the people in the reform groups, we all embraced one another and we said, we're brothers. We're going to try, and, and we're in the process, we're having, we're having correspondence and communications with these people and we are trying to come into harmony and unity with them. The unity of spirit. We don't understand theology exactly the same. Uh, the same is true in regard to free Seventh-day Adventists. There are several free Seventh-day Adventist groups Okay, we're working right now with more than one group saying, can we, con can we develop unity among us? We don't have it yet, but we're working toward it and we're praying for it that the Lord will help us to develop unity of spirit with these different groups. Uh, Are you talking about individual churches? No, I'm not. I'm talking about organizations. Organizations. Uh, and we're also in contact with churches that are totally independent. They don't have anything to do with any organization. They're what you'd call a congregational church. Uh, we're in touch with a bunch of those. And we're saying to those, you know, we need to come into harmony and unity too. We need to first of all develop unity of spirit and then work toward unity of faith and belief. Actually, uh, another thing that we're doing at Steps to Life right now is this. We have a committee. I'm on the committee. I'm not the head of the committee. I'm not chairman. But I'm on this committee and we're working on you're going to hear about this. We're working on the foundations and pillars of the Christian faith. What really are the foundations and pillars of the Christian faith? 
we have to believe the same on the foundations and pillars or we can't have unity at all. Amen. We can't have any. Amen. So we have to believe the same on the foundations and pillars. But here's the catch. The foundation, we're, we're taking the foundations and pillars strictly from the Bible and Ellen White. You have to show us from the Bible and Ellen White that it's a foundation or a pillar or otherwise we won't accept that. Because that's all we need to be in harmony and unity on to, to work together and to have, have unity. We have to agree on the foundations and pillars. For Just for as an example, the immutable late nature, unchangeable nature of the law of God is one of the pillars of the Christian faith. Well, if you have somebody that believes the fourth commandment is binding, somebody that believes it isn't binding, you can't work together. That's impossible. It won't work. You don't believe the same on the, on the very pillars of the faith. Now, Ellen White talked about how the pillars of our, the Christian faith are being attacked. Well, that's true. But uh, we are finding that a lot of things that we are arguing about and fighting with one another are not foundations and pillars. And so if it's not a foundation and pillars, we're, our approach at the present time is, look, you can believe it that way and I can believe it this way and we, don't, we can work together. We don't need to fight over it because that is not a foundation or pillar. Now, if it's a foundation or pillar, well, that's different. We have to believe the same on the foundation of pillars. Now, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but in the conference churches, the found, several of the foundations and pillars are under attack mm -hmm. and about to be wiped out in some places. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy about that. I'm not even happy to announce it, but it's just a fact. You need to know that. And, uh, Without going into detail, could you name a couple of those? Oh well, yeah, the sanctuary. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The sanctuary is a pillar. Uh, the second coming of Christ is part of the foundation of the Christian faith. The uh, spirit of prophecy is part of the foundation of the Adventist faith. Mm -hmm. So uh, those things are those things are foundational. Those are pillars. Uh, you can't. Uh, the state of the dead is a pillar. Mm -hmm. That's a pillar of the Christian faith. If you, if you have somebody that doesn't believe the same on that, well, you're not going to be able to work together. It's not going to work. Uh, now we are studying. We're meeting. We're meeting about an hour every week. We meet. A, we have prayer meeting every Wednesday from seven to eight, and after eight o'clock from eight to nine, we meet for an hour and we study these things. And uh, right now we're studying about the sanctuary and the atonement. By the way, that is at the found. Ellen, I just. I had a statement here. I can't find it because we're looking for it today. I, last night I was on my computer. She's Ellen White says point blank. Our teaching in regard to the ministration of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of the Adventist faith. It's a foundation. If you're mixed up on that, if we don't believe the same on that, well, then we're not going to be able to work together. And that's what's happened in Adventism. We have leaders all over the world that don't believe the sanctuary teaching anymore, like our pioneers believe it. And so if you believe that way, then, then you're going to be at a cross purpose. It's not going to work. But everything is not pillars and foundations. Uh, so we're working on that trying to, in fact I talked to the Reform Adventists when we were there a few weeks ago I said look I, I told them I says we're working on these foundations and pillars of the Christian faith and uh, we're planning to have a camp meeting uh, we, don't, we haven't set a date yet but we're planning to have a camp meeting in several months from now with the Reform Adventists we're going to have a joint camp meeting together and we're going to and we plan at that time to have a report and to study the foundations and pillars and if we believe on this, the same way on the foundations of pillars, then we should be able to work together. Uh, so I better not go farther. I'm not saying that I understand myself all what are the foundations of pillars right now. We're studying it and trying to understand it. Uh, but uh, the Lord is going to bring, as we've looked at the situation, we say, you know, you look at the Reform Adventists, you look at the Free Seventh Day Adventists, and you look at these different groups, we believe the Lord's going to bring all these groups together. We don't know how, but we think we should be working toward that end. Now, let me say something about the conference churches. I am not against the conference churches, although I'm reported all over the world that I am, and that I bash them. I'm not against the conference churches, but let me tell you what the problem is. In the conference churches, there is open sin. That's not my subject right now, so I'm not going to go into that. There's open sin. We cannot come into unity or harmony with any organization that is in open sin. The General Conference is in open sin. Amen. I just mentioned about this lawsuit and putting people in prison and all in this spiritual foundation. That's open sin. We cannot come into unity and harmony with an organization that is in open sin. Now, we would love to come into unity and harmony with them and finish the work much more quickly, just like Jesus could have expedited the, uh, what he was doing much more quickly if the Jews would have cooperated, but they wouldn't cooperate, so something else had to be done. Same thing happening today. Uh, 
we're not saying, please don't misunderstand, we do not say that the General Conference is babbling. We're not saying that at this point, even though they're building an image to the beast. They have the opportunity to turn around. They can decide to repent of their sin, confess it, and put it away. They can decide to do that. But if they don't, we can't, we can't be part of it. That's, that's the problem there. But these other, these other groups, like the Free Seventh-day Adventists that we're working with, they're not an open sin. They're, they're making a lot of mistakes, but I make a lot of mistakes too. There's a difference between making a mistake of any kind of mistake in judgment and living in open sin. That's a complete different situation. The Reform Adventists, as far as we can tell, are not in open sin. We've met with their leaders. And uh, so we may not agree with them on all the theology, but as far as we can tell, they're not in open sin. If we see that they're in open sin, we're going to talk to them about it. And if they see we're in open sin, they're going to talk to us about it. And we ought to. If we see, if we see our brother that's in, and we believe that that person's in open sin, we should tell him. That's right. Now, in regard to the conference, we have told them. But after we tell them, we're not going to do any more. We're not going to take them to court. We're not going to sue anybody. Uh, we've been in situations where we were told by legal persons, well, you can take them to court and you, you can win. You can't. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're not going to take... I've been, studying, I've been studying this quite a bit in the last few years. And I'll just tell you my conscience right now. And if I'm wrong, you're free to correct me. This counsel in 1 Corinthians 6 about not taking the brother to court... I don't think that applies just to general conference. Uh, I know I cannot take a Christian to court. I know I know people in other denominations, they even Sunday keepers, but they're sincere Christians. I can't take those people to court. Uh, if you wrong me and I decide to have to court, take you to court, well, I have to know first of all that you're an apostate. You're not a Christian anymore. Uh, if you're a Christian, I don't care what church you go to. If you're a Christian, I can't take you to court with a clear conscience. I don't want. I'd rather lose than lose my soul. Uh, so this thing about not taking Christians to court, this is more than just the general conference. That's Christians, people that are Christians. So we need to evaluate that carefully and ask the Lord to lead us and guide us so that we don't lose salvation or we're doing something we're told point blank not to do. Now I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that tells you a little bit about where you were at in seeking for unity. We're seeking for unity. Now, I have no, I'm not here criticizing any congregational church. Not at all. I know there's very sincere Seventh-day Adventists in various congregational church. But since you asked this question, I do need to tell you that I am not a congregational Adventist. A congregational Adventist is a person where they go to an independent church and that church, they control everything within. That's congregational church government. I've never believed in that. Uh, I, I believe that the churches should work together as sisterhood. Have a conference is a sisterhood of churches. Originally what a conference was, was a sisterhood of churches that worked together and then they chose officers to be servants of that sisterhood of churches. Now the things have turned upside down today. The people that were supposed to be the servants of the sisterhood of churches have become the lords of the sisterhood of churches. That's totally opposite the way it's supposed to be. But I still believe that the churches should work together as sisterhood of churches. We don't call churches that work together a conference because people get the wrong idea anymore. They they think that they're, they're going to establish what they're... No, we're not trying to do that. But we believe that the churches should try to work together. And uh, where we're at, we're trying to work with several other independent Seventh-day Adventist churches in the Midwest, in our area. We're trying to work together. And uh, a number have joined the International Association of Free Seventh-day Adventists. Some have joined the General Assembly of Free Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, that's another subject. But we're trying to figure out ways to work together. This is not happening just in America. We're in contact with people in Africa that say, you know, we need to work together. And uh, the Lord is going to have a mighty movement before this thing is over, but it might not look that way because the people will just be scattered in little pockets all over the world. Yes? Uh, the Free Seventh-day Adventists that we're acquainted with, with uh, Patrick Herbert's organization, yes. uh, they're all, in, in essence, a congregationalist churches, aren't they? They're self-governing. They're supposed to be self-governing. But... They're not congregational because they have, if they belong to the International Association, they have signed a document that says, we believe these things. That's not congregational. Congregational decides that for themselves. And, okay, and if they 
cited and they don't believe in it, what would you recommend? If they don't believe in it, the International Association officers have their moral responsibility to say that they can't be part of the International Association anymore. They have, they have recognized that and they said publicly, yes, if they are not really Seventh-day Adventists anymore, we, we, they, must, they cannot be part of this group, this International Association of Free Seventh-day Adventists. Has, has that group um, determined what pillars that they will require uh, they spelled it out. You have to, you have to sign what you believe. You do have to sign a document what well, you believe. There's a big long list of right. You know, and like baptismal. Our document. our opinion. This is now. Please, this is just my opinion. What I'm going to tell you now. This is not the International Association. This is just my opinion. And I'm my, I'm a human being. I could be wrong. Uh, my opinion is that we're going to be stronger if we nail it down to just the foundation pillars instead of a whole series of doctrinal beliefs and that's a whole subject a whole subject all by itself uh, the statement of doctrinal beliefs how many times has it been changed now 20 times since 1932 uh, so uh, I personally believe it would be better to stick with the foundation of pillars instead of having a whole list of doctrinal beliefs. But they had to start somewhere. So that's where they started. And we're working with them on those things. We're communicating on those things. Thank you. Yes? Is the nature of Christ considered one of those finer points? Is that the nature of Christ is not a foundation of pillar of the Christian faith. Oh, it's too bad that people were fighting over that for years. We fought all over, over all sorts of things that we don't need to fight about. Uh, the Godhead is not one of the foundation pillars. It's not. Uh, I, I work with, right now, I work with people on both sides. I can work with them on both sides as long as they do not make it a test question. But if they make it a test question and they say, you have to believe it the way I believe it, then I'm stuck. But I'm working with people on both sides of that kind of, well, I should say both sides. How many sides are there of that one? Four? Six? Yes. You know what, ultimately it's going to have to be God because there's a quote in Ellen White's statement and it says, at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost and went forth to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. Yes. If you catch that, it's at the commencement of the time of trouble. So apparently all these sideline bar issues just blow away. And when the Holy Spirit falls upon those who are, as you say, getting the sin out of their lives so that the Holy Spirit can fill us, then they'll just go forward. And y'all have seen it. They go forward in one step, one accord, like soldiers, and they're just walking together in the same step. They're not bickering. They're not arguing. They're not saying, is this true? Is this true? They all know. Yes. But if you read it, it's at the commencement of the time of trouble. And I found that startling because, as you said at the beginning of this whole uh, seminar today, It'll come at a time when we least expect it. So apparently, some major crisis is going to occur, which was going to was going to start the time of trouble, and then we were filled with the Holy Ghost. She's talking there about what we normally call the little time of trouble. However, I need to say, if you go through the time of trouble, you won't know the little time of trouble from the big time of trouble. It'll all just be one great big trouble. Uh, <laughs> It'll be what we call a little time of trouble is not little, let me tell you. Read the Spirit of Prophecy. What, what you call a little time of trouble, when you can't buy and sell, that's not going to be little. And so the, the little time of trouble will just flow right into the what we call the big time of trouble. It'll be one great big time of trouble, and it will, the little time of trouble, of course, will begin before probation closes, and it will be during that little time of trouble when probation will close, and then we'll be in the big time of trouble. When you're in the big time of trouble, you will recognize it, because when the plagues begin to fall, you, unless you're in some dungeon somewhere and you don't know what's happening, uh, you'll know, you'll know that the plagues are falling. Uh, but until the plagues begin to fall, you won't know exactly what the time is. In fact, there's one statement on what talks about how the devil doesn't know that the probation is closed and the devil doesn't know it. He sees the saints are guarded by angels and he assumes that they're sealed, but he doesn't really know. So, see, there's some things that the Lord hadn't told anybody. Yes? Well, saints are sealed before the rest of the world. Yeah, what do you want to tell me about that? Well, I, I just wanted to clarify that. Maybe, maybe the saints are sealed before the well, rest of the world. The rest of the world is not sealed. It's my understanding that we're sealed first. So before who? Before the general, those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists and know the truth, 
we're sealed first. Oh, you mean that? Okay, I understand what you're saying now. Yes, yeah, so some people are sealed before others. Yeah, I, I would, I would never argue that point. The, the sealing, the timing concerning the sealing. There's a lot of difference of opinion among very sincere Adventists who've done a lot of research. So I don't, I, I listen, but I don't know the, all the answers on that. Yes, brother. Mrs. White speaks of a new organization that may come about where books of a new order would be written, where yes. the Sabbath would be lightly regarded. Yes. And the last thing she mentions is that storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Yes. Do you think the conference has met this criteria? Well, I preached a sermon about that, showing that they met the criteria in 1993. Uh, and I published a booklet about it called No New Organization. Uh, but after it appears that some certain criteria have been met, things can go on for a period of time. For instance, uh, things were at a very, very serious situation when God told Noah there's going to be a flood in 120 years. There were all, Ellen White says that polygamy was one of the major reasons for the flood. And they were practicing polygamy before Noah ever started building the ark. And they were practicing it for the next 120 years. So you can be meeting all the specifications for a judgment to happen, and yet it can be a period of time until it actually does happen. Uh, the same was true in regard to Sodom and Gomorrah. That night, Ellen White says the crimes they committed that last night weren't any worse than crimes that they had been committing nightly for many, many nights. So they've been living that way for a long, long time. And, you know, that's in the Lord's domain. It's when's the time, now's the time, we're gonna, it's, it's going to come to an end. That's in the Lord's domain. But yes, appreciate your comment. Yes. I just wanted to kind of comment on what you were saying about uh, the little finer points. You know, the book of Ephesians talks about that, how we as the saints of God will come into the unity of faith. So I believe that not only on the, the doctrinal points, but even on the finer points, there will not be one point in which we err, uh, err or differ from one another. The Bible says that there will be one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and all, we all, all, we'll all be on one accord. You know, just like it was in the in the uh, with the saints and the apostles in the in the uh, Pentecostal day. You know, when they got the outpouring, and they were in the uh, the Bible says in Acts two, they were all in one accord. Yes. And, uh, in the upper room, and I believe that it'll be the same way again. And she says so in the, in the Spirit of Prophecy, it'll be the same way again. You know, in the in the last day. Okay. Yes. Okay. Got a bunch of hands. We're one over here. Going back to when you were talking about the time of trouble, as we see these things coming. To pass, no buy and no sell. Shouldn't we be doing like Joseph, like they did, and they stocked up when they knew that the famine and everything were coming? Shouldn't okay, there are certain famine? there are certain things we've been advised to do, and certain things we've been told not to do. Okay. We've been advised to get our families, as the Lord opens up the way, to get our families out of the cities into country places. There's exceptions to that. Seventy percent of the world's population lives in large cities. The three angels' messages have to go to the large cities. So Ellen White, she's very clear about this. Some people will have to remain in the large cities right up until a very short time before the close of probation. So we cannot tell other people what to do. The people that are the most dangerous if they're in a city are people that have small children. So some people the Lord has sent into these large cities to give the last message. We can't pass judgment on who's supposed to be where. But if the Lord opens up the way for you to, even if you're in a large city, if the Lord's opened up the way when you're working in a large city to be on the outskirts or in the, in the country outside the city, we've been advised to do that. Now, in the country, if you live in the country, then you're in a situation where you can raise food. And uh, that's going to be important when you can't buy and sell to be able to raise food. But we have been advised not to do, I was going to say what the Mormons do, uh, the Mormons do this. They stock up food for two or three or four years. Uh, we've been advised not to do that. Uh, and uh, when it, So if you're stocking up food, it's in, we don't understand today. We used to just go to the grocery store. In previous ages, everybody stocked up food for the winter because, you, uh, you know, 150 years ago, if you lived right around here, you had to have food in the wintertime, and uh, you couldn't grow it in the wintertime. It's too cold here, so you stocked up potatoes. My, my grandparents used to have a cellar, root cellar, and and uh, you know they had turnips and potatoes and squash and cabbages and, and a root cellar. Those things will keep till January, February. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some, in fact, carrots and potatoes, if you're stored right, they'll keep until next summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so they to store up food for to get through the winter. That's one thing. But to store up food for several years, yeah. 
is not a good thing for several reasons. Uh, Ellen White advises against it. She says if you have food stored up like that, that the wicked will come and steal it from you anyway. You won't have it. And uh, so it's one thing to live in the country and have food stored for the winter. It's another thing to have food stored for several years. I must get into that this area directly, but I'll just mention this real quickly. Food that is stored slowly loses its nutritional value. And so you do not want to store food. You say, well, I'll store food for three years ahead, and then I'll just eat the food that's three years old. That's not good health reform. You don't want to eat food three years old if you don't have to. Uh, so it's best not to store your food for generally for more than one year. There are exceptions. There are two foods that I know of. I only know of two. I know of two foods that, they're, that I'm told that if you store them properly, you can store them almost forever. One is honey. And, and the reason for that is the osmolality is so great that microorganisms can't grow in it. One is honey, and the second one is wheat. Uh, there is wheat they found in tombs in Egypt that's thousands of years old that you can still plant it, or you can still grind it up and eat it. And uh, I do not know of any other food other than those two. Uh, dried corn, oats, uh, beans, not dried beans, none of those keep forever. In, in, in two, three, four years, they, you, you'll even be able to tell the taste different. But wheat is different. So I suppose you can store up wheat for longer and honey. But other than that, you don't want to store food for more than a year. Okay. Hey, one more question. Yes. Being an overcomer is one of the pillars of our faith. Well, being an overcomer is a major part of the sanctuary message. You can't study the sanctuary and really understand it without understanding the sanctuary. That's why people hate the sanctuary doctrine. Because the sanctuary doctrine teaches that your sins are going to be separated from you. You're not going to have to be a part of your life anymore. So that's part of the sanctuary message, yes. That's, so that's a pillar of the Christian faith. Yes, brother. What about canned goods? Yeah, what about them? Does that lose uh, Yes, they lose nutritional value over time. But, but it's not as bad as fresh. Oh, yeah, oh yes. It's, if you're starving and you have canned fruit from five years ago, it'll, it'll probably be good and you can eat it. But uh, it won't be the same as food that was canned last year. There have been a lot of studies done on that, but I haven't been 30 years since I studied it. But I have studied it. And uh, all food, dried food, canned food, uh, frozen especially. Fro frozen food, you don't want to ever keep frozen food more than about a year. Yes. I want to go back to your original uh, message when you were talking about the lie. The, the what? Second, the Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, where you said yes. they would believe a lie. God will send a strong delusion. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I, I originally interpreted that, and I thought I've heard someone else interpret that as if because they they reject the gospel, God will actually send a supernatural lie. And E.G. White, in her statements, uh, things that we'll bear now, but she says that there's so, if, if every one of your senses will be tested. It'll, with your eyes, your hearing, your, your uh, the sound of, uh, like when Satan, we, we're, we're told in the, in the spirit prophecy that he'll come as an angel of light and he'll actually look like Jesus. Yes. I thought that that was the masterful delusion that's referred to in the scriptures. Now, what you said, it, it could be a parallel. But I, I was really, I was really a little shocked when you referred to the, the lie. I, you referred to it as believing you can live in sin and still be saved, which I don't, I don't take that away. I was just, I was just wondering if you do believe that there will be. It's, it's the masterful delusion. It's, it's I think it's, Satan okay. appearing as Christ will be the overwhelming, overmastering delusion. And what will be involved in that is that he will promise salvation to the people that are breaking God's law and tell the people that are keeping God's law that they're going to be lost if they don't start keeping Sunday. So, yes, I don't have I don't have any argument with what you just said. I believe that. Yes. One of the things that I haven't heard people talk about, it, you know, in preparation for end time events, you know, we speak about moving into the country. And raising our own food, but she also tells us to have our own industry, in the, to have industries yes. in the country. And um, you know, you don't hear that. Your industries that you have in the country will mostly get shut down during the little time of trouble because you will not be able to buy and sell. So when you can't buy and sell, most of your industries will be shut down. 
but uh, there's all kinds of theories about that, and I, I don't know the answer. Some people believe that God's children will be enabled to barter some. I don't know the answer to all those things. Uh, I know that, that in the little time of trouble, none of us will get through it unless, except by divine grace. We are going to have to have divine help to get through that, even the little time of trouble. We're not going to get through it. No matter how much we prepare, we are not going to get through it unless the Lord intervenes and helps us. It's just like with Noah and the ark. Noah spent 120 years building that ark, and it was a strong structure, but that ark, the flood was so severe that they would have all drowned, even in the ark. They would not have survived if God hadn't protected the ark. Ellen White's very clear about that. The angels of God protected that ark so that it didn't go down, because that was, a, that was the most severe... I don't know if any of you have been in the ocean, but... If you had an ocean around the world, there was no, there was the waves would just keep getting bigger and bigger, and you'd have waves hundreds and hundreds of feet high. They would never have survived the flood, except God protected the ark. We're going to have to have divine protection to get through the little time of trouble, too. Okay, maybe we're done with questions now. Let's see. I'm not trying to overlook somebody, but I don't want to worry out either. There's one more hand back there. Um, when you say that the uh, Adventist church is. Um they, they might not be worshiping the beast, but in a sense of worshiping the image of the beast. And when you say the image of the beast is uh, the Sunday worship, what do you mean when you say that? The image of the beast is when a Christian church uses the state to get their way. That's very clear in Great Controversy, page 445. The image of the beast is when the church... Now, the image of the beast is not fully formed yet. Please don't misunderstand. I have not said that the image of the beast is fully formed. It's being built right now. But the, it will be fully formed when you have a whole group of churches in the United States that get together and influence the state to do what they want them to do. And what they're going to want them to do is make a national Sunday law. And so if you bow to what these churches get enacted by the government, you will be worshiping the image of the beast. That will be when it's final. Now it's being built right now, but that's the way it'll be when it's all done. Yes? I've heard that the Catholic Church is suing the Adventist Church right now over the, the great controversy. That they're calling it hate literature. I don't, you know, I don't keep up on everything that's going on, so I don't know the, the answer to that one, so I couldn't answer. Yes? Okay. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, maybe we're done. Yes? Well, I don't have a question. I seriously going to make a statement. If anybody, um, at the, one of the first questions that were asked concerning the unity of the faith, and um, I think it was last year or the year before that, I've actually been having some correspondence with the previous year with the Vidian Seventh day Adventists, um, No Separate Zavala. And um, we had at this church some doctrinal. Uh, discussions, I guess you could say. Yes. So um, I actually compiled a book on the spirit of prophecy and the scripture about unity of the faith and last day events in the last days. And it's all Bible and spirit of prophecy and some pioneers. If anybody wants me to email to them, it actually comes to the questions that were asked uh, tonight from the spirit of prophecy. Um, if anybody wants to give me their email, I can email that to them. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. What's your last name again? Strong. Strong. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, there's a there's an opportunity. Okay, are we done? Just one more. Where? Where am I not seeing? Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, when you had mentioned earlier about um, how the conference church does, um, in, well, how how the free church and the conference church deal with open sin and how it, how they differ. Um, what scriptural would you use in reference to deal with open sin? You know, once it's presented, let's say. Example, a lay member comes to the pastor or the shepherd of that congregation and say, this is a situation that's going on, I'm aware of this particular situation, and I was a victim of it, and it was involving a leader like a deacon or whatever position yes. they have, and it was brought to their attention. What is the protocol? What scripture reference do they use? Matthew 18 is the protocol. Matthew 18 started verse 15 is the protocol. However, there's an exception to that. If it is a public sin, uh, Matthew 18 is about a sin that's private. If there's a public sin, the protocol is in uh, is it First Timothy 5. Those that sin rebuke openly before If It's a public sin. It has to be dealt with public. We have had that situation in our church. I was afraid at one time I might need to resign as being the pastor of the church because I would not consent to pastor a church that was an open sin. But the 
church decided they wouldn't tolerate open sin and they disfellowshiped the people. So I was able to remain as a pastor. But uh, you cannot be a member of a church that condones open sin in the members. Now, anybody can come to a church to worship. We've had people with all, every kind of sin problem you can think of. People that have been in prison, people that are homosexuals, people that are all kind of problems come to our church to worship. That's fine. But if they're living in that open sin, then they cannot be a church member because then the church is condoning open sin if you allow a church a person to be a member of a church and live in open sin. So I can't be a member of a church or I can't be a member of a church organization that will condone open sin. But remember, open sin is not the same as having a difference of opinion on theology. It's a different, different thing. Sin is breaking the moral law. Amen. I'm I'm sorry, I'm not following exactly what you're asking. Because if a woman was married, what? She's not married and she's pregnant. Okay, if she's not married and she's pregnant. Well, then you have to ask more questions. Was she raped or what happened? Uh, you know, uh, I can't answer a question like that unless I know. I've learned to not try to answer questions until I know all the facts and all the facts I can get. And uh, so in a situation like that, then the next question is, let's suppose that she's pregnant because she was living with somebody. She wasn't married to them. The next question is, has she repented? If she's repented and confessed it and says, I'm sorry, and I don't want to live that way anymore, we will allow that person to be a member of our church even before the baby's born. We will allow the person to be a member of that church. But if they're living in open sin and they won't repent, that's well, then you're right. stuck. That's right. A person that's, that's caught in any kind of an open sin can repent and confess, and the Lord will take the back, and the church must take the back. But if, uh, when we're talking about open sin, we're talking about open sin that is not repented of, it's not confessed, and they won't stop it. That's right. That's, That's a different right. deal. That's a different deal. What was this okay, one? now, first, first maybe we'll get to going forever here. Let's, well, now, that'll this? open up a can of worms. Go ahead. What was the scripture reference that you gave in 1 Timothy for private? 1 uh, no. Timothy 5. Was it 1 Timothy 5? Mm-hmm. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. That's uh, 1 Timothy 5.20. Thanks. Okay, I think we better stop. If there's somebody else has a question, I'm not trying to stop you. See me after everybody's gone, you can stop and see me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'm not trying to shut anybody off, but it's almost 5 o'clock, I think. So uh, let's have prayer and dismiss. And if there's somebody else that has a question they need to talk to you, I'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, but we, I think we need to close the meeting. Father in heaven, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. We thank you that you have promised that you're going to have a people that come into the unity of the faith, that come to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Lord, we want to be part of that people. We realize that we are very faulty. We know that we don't have perfect characters. We know that we need to be changed. We need to be transformed by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we earnestly plead. We claim your promise. You have promised us, Lord, that the person who began a good work in you will finish it. And you do not leave junk. You do not leave a person that's just half transformed. You have promised, Lord. You've given us your word and you cannot lie. And so we're depending upon that. We know from looking at our past that you have begun a good work in us. We're surrendering ourselves totally and completely to you. We're choosing to follow Jesus, to live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. And so we humbly pray that you will fulfill your word and that the good work that you have begun in us, that you will finish it to the day of Christ as you promised. May we all be together in that grand reunion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.